Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Lentz, and I'm the marketing manager for the analytics portfolio at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator today, and uh, thank you for joining us. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Uh, so to ask questions, all you have to do is to click on the Q&A button in the Zoom navigation bar, usually found at the top or bottom of your screen, and type in your questions. We'll get to as many of them as you can, uh, and then we'll reserve those uh, for the end of the presentation, like I said. And now I'd like to introduce Donna Chen, our product manager for the Big Tuna, and Ross Walton, uh, who's the application scientist for our analytics portfolio. Today, Donna and Ross will take us through how you can combine automated buffer exchange and AAV stability uh, measurements in high throughput and on a small scale in Big Tuna and Uncle. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Donna and then Ross. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, so Ross and I will be uh, exploring the tools for fast tracking AV formulation development and um, the characterizing stability for AV with you today um, using Big Tuna and Onco. AV development is a lot like playing with pinatas. We blindly hit the capsid um, with all kinds of stress conditions, hoping to find that one stabilizing conditions. Wouldn't it be nice if we can actually take off that blindfold and see things when it happens clearly? We're gonna be talking about how we can help you take off that blindfold and fast track the process development for AAV particles um, today. The big questions when developing the AAVs are always, is my virus aggregated? And also, is my virus capsid intact still? Both of these two questions um, have great impacts on how you're going to do capsid design and do formulation selections and process development. And more importantly, they ultimately impact the product potency and the safety. To fast track the development process and to characterize these uh, character, uh, stabilizing characteristics, Unchained Lab have the perfect two tools to help you do it. Big Tuna is here to do automate up buffer exchange and concentrate the AAV samples into the right working conditions and also concentration range. And Unco is here to help you characterize the stability of the AV particles. Everybody needs to do buffer exchange. It doesn't matter if you're doing therapeutics protein development or AAV engineering. Starting from cell line production all the way to um, going through analytics and developing the functional assays and more downstream, the formulation selection. You just can't get away from doing buffer exchange. Uh, but with the dialysis, centrifugation, and TFF methods, these are all great techniques to do method development if you have very few samples to work with. But if you have many, many samples to push through or many buffer selections that you wanna try, none of these uh, techniques are ideal. Originally developed to, do, uh, pro to help break through the bottlenecks of protein buffer exchange, uh, we also find out Big Tuna is a great automating buffer exchange system for AV particles um, and other virus-like particles as well. What it does is you can exchange and concentrate sample up to 95 samples all at once. And we have flexible volume input from as little as 100 microliter in AML per sample. And we've designed Big Turnout to be so simple to use. You can finish uh, from designing your experiment all the way to load your deck to in just 30 minutes. And you can let Big Turnout take care of the rest of the buffer exchange and concentration for you. Big Tuna is a filtration plate-based buffer exchange system. It uses two consumables, unfiltered 96 and unfiltered 24. Um, both of them are in, made with regenerated cellulose membrane and are in SBS standard formats. So they're um, uh, automation instruments compatible. So unfiltered 96 is a 96 well plate with a volume input of 100 microliter to 400 microliter. Um, the, there's molecular weight cutoff options, four of them, uh, ranging from three kilodalton all the way to 100 kilodalton. And the unfiltered 24 is a 24-well format plate 
uh, the sample input volume starts from 450 microliter all the way to 8 ml. And we have the 10 kDa cutoff option for this plate. How does Big Tuna automate the buffer exchange? So it is a um, ultrafiltration and diafiltration method in combination with three unique comp uh, components that makes it work. So there is the pressure chamber, and then we have an acoustic volume sensor and an orbital mixer to automate the whole process. The process starts when you have your sample filled unfiltered plate placed inside the buffer chamber. And the first thing the uh, instrument is going to do is going to take the acoustic volume sensor to measure the input volume uh, for each of for every well. Once we know the initial volume, we're going to apply the positive pressure to remove filtrate um, on the set volume, um, on set targeted volume. So once the filtrate is removed, the volume sensor will come and measure the volume again to make sure the amount uh, re the filtrate removed um, is to the target percentage. And we're going to replace or refill the each well with a new buffer. And the motion of um, doing pressurization to remove the filtrate, uh, measuring it with a volume sensor to make sure we remove the right volume and replace it with a new buffer is going to go in cycle iterations until the uh, well is completely replaced with a new buffer. And at the end of buffer exchange process, Bictona can also concentrate the sample down to your right working concentration range. Or there's also option for Bictona to just bypass buffer exchange and directly go to concentration. And all the while the buffer exchange, uh, the pressure is going to remove the filtrate, there's a gentle orbital mixing action going. So this will fast, actually fast track the buffer exchange process by constantly stirring up the particles um, so we can prevent the concentration gradient from building up near the membrane surface. And this will help mitigate the risk of clogging the membrane well. So now that we know how Big Tuna automates buffer exchange for AAV particles, I'm gonna let Ross talk about how UNCLE can help um, doing the characterization of the, the uh, AAV stability. Thanks, Donna. So like Kevin said earlier, I'm Ross Fulton. I'm one of the application scientists here at Unchained Labs. UNCLE is an all-in-one multimodal stability platform that contains two different lasers, a 266 nanometer laser and a 473 nanometer laser. The 266 nanometer laser is ideal for uh, looking at capsid protein stability using intrinsic fluorescence, while the 473 nanometer laser can excite a, a variety of fluorescent dots, including uh, DNA uh, sensitive dots like cyber gold. UNCLE also have reads full spectrum fluorescence, so you get the whole picture of your AAV capsid and its thermal stability with or without labels, depending on what you need. Those two lasers are also used for static light scattering, or SLS, which tells you how a sample, uh, how the AAV is aggregating during a thermal ramp. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is great for looking at detailed measurements of, uh, or detailed information about the sizes of particles in your solution, the sizes of your AAV caps in your solution, uh, and looking at the size distribution to tell you if you've got uh, you know, large aggregates before or after an experiment. All three of these detection uh, methods can be used either at room temperature, isothermally, or during a thermal ramp with UNCLE's uh, very fine temperature control from 15 to 95 degrees Celsius. So this stability platform is built for biologics and works amazingly well for looking at AAV stability. UNCLE uses this unique sample holder, which we call the UNI. A uni contains 16 wells that are actually nine microliter quartz cuvettes. You can use anywhere from one to all 16 of these wells during an experiment. Before an experiment, 
The uni is clamped in between two silicone gaskets, sealing either end and held within this blue frame. That keeps your sample safe and secure during an experiment. And what gives you the high throughput and low volumes that are, work so well and are so important for AAV stability. Uncle looks at two different kinds of AAV stability. So capsid stability and aggregation. Capsid stability can be broken down into two different types of stability. Capsid disruption, where your entire capsid just falls apart, and genome ejection, where the genome actually gets ejected from the capsid while the capsid remains mostly intact. Then, of course, there's aggregation, which can be uh, intact capsids all sticking together or these disrupted, broken down capsid proteins all sticking together. You can look at aggregation either before an experiment at time zero using DLS or look at it during heating. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, looking a little bit more in depth at the two different kinds of capsid stability, if you have an intact capsid and add heat, it can break down, fall apart, or it can actually eject its genome. And we're actually gonna look at some of the data that supports this model. So in this paper from uh, Bernard in 2018, the authors heated samples of AAV8 and AAV9 up to various temperatures and used atomic force microscopy to look at the different morphologies. They found three distinct morphologies during, this experiment, during these experiments. The first were these bright white dots you can see in that purple box, which were just intact capsids. The second morphology they witnessed were the sort of bright white dot with almost a little string coming out of it, which they hypothesized is linearly ejected single-stranded DNA coming out of an intact capsid. The last one morphology they observed were this sort of bundle or pile of single strand DNA, which they hypothesized was what, was rema what remained after the capsids were completely disrupted. Uncle uses the same model for looking at the two different kinds of capsid stability, but uses slightly different detection methods, which are a lot faster than AFM. First, it uses intrinsic fluorescence to measure the changes in the protein capsid proteins as they unfold. And with that, we can look at capsid disruption and assign a TM to that process. It actually uses a cyber gold uh, fluorescent dye, or really could use any uh, DNA fluorescent dye, DNA sensitive fluorescent dye to look at genome ejection. Of course, these dyes have very low fluorescence when they're not bound to DNA, but when they come in contact with DNA, for example, after it gets ejected from the genome, the fluorescence increases by a huge amount. And Uncle can detect that increase in fluorescence emission. Uncle's the only tool that has full spectrum fluorescence and can look at both intrinsic fluorescence and these dye-based methods in the one box. So to start taking a look at uh, doing a stabi what a stability study might look like using uh, uh, Big Tuna and Uncle, we did buffer exchange of a sample of AAV9 into five different buffers in Big Tuna and then concentrated it twofold. We took those samples and looked at them in two different applications on UNCLE, the TMTAG with DLS application, which lets us look at intrinsic fluorescence, and then the viral toolbox, which lets us look at genome ejection. Uh, both of these uh, applications lets you look at aggregation with DLS or with SLS, depending on your needs. The big tuna uh, buffer exchange setup was relatively simple. So we used an unfiltered 96 with a 10 kD molecular weight cutoff, an initial volume, an initial AAV concentration of seven times 10 to the 11 CP per mil, and initial volume of 380 microliters. This sample of AAV9 started in a PBS buffer at pH 7.4 with a little bit of pleuronic mixed in there to make sure that it doesn't stick to anything. The final volume we, were, uh, we ended up with was, uh, 180, I was 190 microliters. Now you may notice that the first buffer on that list is just the same as the uh, starting material, the starting buffer. And that's because we wanted to have a process control during this entire experiment. 
The other buffers were buffers that were chosen based on buffers that are used in chromatography, either ion exchange chromatography or affinity chromatography. Big Tuna was able to complete all of these buffer exchanges in, uh, and do the concentration in under two hours. Looking at that first call, that first row, you can see that our process control showed about a, a full recovery, about 100% recovery, which is great news. The other buffers had similarly high percent recoveries, except for that citrate phosphate buffer, which seems to have a really low percent recovery. Now, we were using ELISAs in order to quantify uh, the concentrations before and after uh, big tunas, uh, before and after big tuna. So since all the other buffers were working as expected and we were getting good recoveries, we thought maybe there's something special going on with this citrate phosphate buffer. And using UNCLE, we were able to find out what that special something was. DLS is a tool that can be used to look at the size distribution of particles in your sample based on their scattering intensities over time. Now, in most of our uh, most of the buffers we tested, and in the starting material, we just had a single peak in the DLS intensity distribution, which means that all, basically all of the particles were monodispersed and about 25 nanometers in size, which is what you'd expect for an intact virus. However, that citrate phosphate buffer, which is the red line, had a second peak that was much larger than an intact virus should be. That peak was aggregates. Since the ELISA we were using is specific for intact particles and doesn't bind to aggregates, that told us why our percent recoveries were so low, because the ELISA wasn't detecting particles that were actually still there. That shows you the value and the importance of using DLS before an experiment and to know what's a little bit more about what's going on before you start doing anything. And it's a quick check that only takes a few minutes. When we compare the uh, capsid disruption, genome injection, and aggregation uh, metrics of, PBA, of the starting material and the uh, process control after it's been buffer exchanged and concentrated, we can see two things. First, the green lines tend to be a bit higher in, uh, than the blue lines, and that's because simply there's more material to look at. So you get higher levels of uh, cyber gold intensity because there's more DNA and more aggregation because, and uh, a higher SLS signal because there's simply more particles and more particles scatter more light. Looking at the actual metrics, however, you can see that there's essentially no difference between PBS before and after uh, big tuna. So buffer exchange and concentration doesn't really impact stability at all. Comparing capsid disruption in those, in those low volumes between all five of our uh, ex exchanged and concentrated samples, you can see that for the most part, they all have very similar capsid unfolding temperatures between 76 and 77 degrees C. So I wouldn't call these to be different at all. The only one that was different was that citrate phosphate buffer, which unfolded a much lower temperature than any of the other buffers. So this, the sample, the AAV9, is unfolding more readily in that, citrate that acidic citrate phosphate buffer than it was in any of the other buffers. Looking a little bit more in depth at how UNCLE catches a genome's ejection, you can see at the start of an experiment, you've got intact capsids that contains DNA, free unbound uh, dye, and then dye that's bound to a, the small amount of free DNA that's floating in the sample. When you start heating the sample, those capsids start to eject their genomes, and the unbound dye binds to that ejected DNA, and the fluorescence increases steadily during the entire thermal ramp until it reaches a maximum at about 70 degrees Celsius, when the, all of the capsids have broken apart, all of the DNA is available for binding to the dye. By looking at sort of the midpoint or the uh, inflection point in these curves, in these slopes, we're able to determine a TM of genome ejection. Looking at these TMs of genome ejections just between the PBS process control and the citrate phosphate buffer, there was a huge impact of buffer on the genome ejection temperature, a difference of 11.9 degrees. You compare that to the capsid unfolding TM that we figured uh, that we determined using intrinsic fluorescence in the earlier slides, 
where the difference there was only 4.4 degrees Celsius between uh, PBS and citrate phosphate buffer. So in order to get a full picture of the stability of AAV, you really need to look at both genome ejection and capsid unfolding, because they're not always going to be the same. And UNCLE is the only tool that lets you look at both of those. If all you have is some other intrinsic DSF uh, tool, or are trying, if you're trying to do uh, use Cipro Orange to look at protein stability, you're going to miss out on this really important genome ejection phenomenon. UNCLE also lets you look at aggregates during a thermal ramp. So we, during the same thermal ramp uh, as the earlier, you know, simultaneous with looking at genome ejection, we were also able to look at the formation of aggregates as the temperature increased because the light scattering, the static light scattering of our 473 nanometer laser also increased. And we can assign a TAG right where that SLS intensity starts to increase. Now, obviously the citrate phosphate buffer was aggregating at room temperature, but that aggregation got significantly worse during thermal ramping, starting at about 43.5 degrees Celsius. Whereas in the PBS buffer, which AAV9 seemed, this AAV9 seemed, which, uh, seemed to be quite happy in, didn't start aggregating until about 75 degrees Celsius. So much more thermally stable in this PBS buffer. So key points, key points that, to take away from this is first that concentration by big tuna did not impact uh, AAV stability as when it was just concentrated into the same buffer as it started. AAV9 was least stable in this citrate phosphate pH 4.0 buffer and actually aggregated at room temperature immediately upon being exchanged into the buffer. And in this van, the buffers actually impacted genome ejection more than they impacted capsid disruption. So with that, I hope you have an, uh, some, a good picture of how you can use Big Tuna and Uncle in conjunction to fast track AAV stability using Big Tuna for sample prep and buffer exchange of up to 96 samples at a time, completely uh, unattended and automated, and then use UNCLE for characterization and stability assessment of 48 samples at a time using TMTAG, the viral toolbox, and one of its other applications. So with Big Tuna and UNCLE, you can finally have the tools you need to make sure your AAV is well protected and won't fall apart under stress. Thanks for your time and we're gonna be happy to take questions. All right, so uh, thanks to Don and Ross for that. Uh, that sounds like an excellent overview first of the Big Tuna. We're learning about automated buffer exchange and the three pieces of technology that make the Big Tuna special. Uh, that pressure chamber, the acoustic sensor to keep track of volumes, and the orbital mixing to make sure that nothing accumulates at the, the filter plate. Uh, then we learned about the basics of UNCLE technology, um, including the three different detection methods and the ways that those can be uniquely used to look at uh, aggregation, capsid disruption, and genome injection for AAV. And then we kind of combined both of those pieces of, pieces of equipment to understand how big tuna can concentrate or buffer exchange AAV uh, without you know, causing damage to the capsid, um, but that buffers indeed can cause severe changes to capsid stability, uh, both causing impacts in terms of aggregating at room temperature and reducing their ability to, to stand up to thermal stress. Uh, so overall, pretty nice story understanding both uh, the application of Big Tuna and then how UNCLE can help diagnose stability. Uh, so we have some great questions that have already been submitted. Um, so for anyone out there watching right now, you can still submit an a question through the Q&A uh, uh, section of your Zoom navigation bar. And let's see, I'll start picking questions from that list. Uh, so I believe the first question is for Donna about the Big Tuna. And the question is, what if my samples have different viscosities or concentrations in my plate? Yeah, so ideally you want to set up big tuna runs with samples uh, with similar concentration and flow rates. Uh, but we know that's not possible, always possible in the real life, life uh, lab situation. So even if you put the same concentration sample in, you're going to start to see variations in different flow rates. Some wells are just going to flow faster and some of the wells are just going to flow slower. Uh, so the way big tuna addresses it is that since we're tracking the float rate for every single well, um, 
we can adjust the pressurization amount of pressurization time uh, to either shorten it or longer it, to make it longer. So shorten it will match it to the fastest flowing well um, to make sure that those fa fastest flowing well does not run dry. Um, and if the slower well didn't meet the targeted percentage removal, it's going to hold off. And we're going to extend another filtration cycle to make sure that the slower well will catch up um, to, to the final exchange percentage that you set. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what is the maximum number of samples and buffers big tuna can buffer exchange? Uh, so uh, depend on the plate type you use. So if you use the unfiltered 24, you can exchange up to 24 different samples and 24 different unique uh, buffers, it, it, anything in between. And if you use the unfiltered 96, you can use uh, 96 samples and 96 uh, uh, buffers, anything in between as well. OK. Uh, and then uh, still for, for Donna about the big tuna, since it seems like that you know, those questions came in first, uh, can I still use the plate if I didn't use up all the wells in a run? Oh, uh, yeah. So you don't have to use up the entire plate for every run you do it. Um, so if you only use part of the wells, um, that's OK. You can keep the plate. Um, and then the next time you want to use the unused wells, just go ahead when you do the play design on the Big Tuna software, uh, track the ones that has been used, and you can continue to use use the unused ones. We don't recommend you reuse the already spent wells, though. Uh, and actually, I think I probably have one more question here uh, about the Big Tuna. Uh, can, can you use the Big Tuna system for envelope viruses and LNPs? Um, yeah, actually, we've tried um, with different customers. So we've tried LMPs and other large complex molecules and uh, virus-like molecules as well, um, particles as well. So yeah, it can certainly work. Okay. All right. And here we have a, an uncle question for Ross. Uh, so what is the concentration range for uncle when working with the AAVs? Oh, so uh, concentrations for uncle with AAVs is uh, 5 times 10 to the 11 VG per mil up to 10 to the 14 VG per uh, ml. And you can go a little bit outside of those depending on uh, circumstances, um, but those tend to give us the best results. Okay. Uh, does a formulation always have the same impact on capsid unfolding, genome ejection, and aggregation? Uh, no, not at all, actually. So um, as we saw, the, the even if the direction is the same, for example, if a buffer makes uh, a, an AAV less stable, but, uh, the magnitude can vary quite a bit between genome ejection and uh, capsid unfolding. But we've also seen conditions where, um, you know, a, a buffer condition or formulation uh, for an AAV has the same capsid unfolding as for another condition, uh, but the aggregation or the genome ejection are completely different. So yeah, all three of those metrics are absolutely vital to understanding how AAV stability works. Okay, great. And then you also mentioned a little bit about uh, intrinsic DSF. So I understand that you know intrinsic DSF was what we were looking at for capsid disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually have a question here. How can Uncle measure cybergold fluorescence? Yeah, so that's actually one of the great things about having full spectrum fluorescence. So we don't just look at that sort of, you know, 200 up to 400 nanometer range where um, you know we get intrinsic fluorescence, but we're looking at the entire spectrum. So with the 473 nanometer laser, we can excite the dye. And then with the full spectrum detection, we can detect its emission. So those two things combined are what lets us look at cyber gold and actually a number of other uh, fluorescent dyes as well, uh, including, for example, zirco orange. Okay. All right. And this uh, uh, looks like a, a uncle question as well. Um, and I have some thoughts too. Uh, but it's, it's how does melting temperature for AAV uh, correlate with infectivity or potency values? Um, so there's actually mixed literature on that, which is kind of interesting. Um, so obviously, you know, if, if your uh, AAV gets up to a temperature where the genome gets ejected, it's no longer infectious. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty obvious. Um, and of course, if it's aggregated, also no longer infectious. Uh, but as for where sort of the, I guess, ideal genome ejection temperature is, that's actually a little bit unclear because uh, there's some evidence that a slightly lower uh, genome ejection temperature makes it so that it's easier for the genome to get released into a cell uh, during infection. Um, 
But of course, that's balanced by it's just less stable generally, so more likely to break down. Uh, it seems like there's sort of a sweet spot, a balancing act that you have to do uh, between those two extremes. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And there was actually a nice paper, uh, I believe it was through Nature this summer, coming out of Guangping Gao's lab at UMass, uh, where they looked at AAV2 versus what they called AAV V66. Uh, and they were studying that their V66 capsid had better capsid stability uh, at different pHs, but actually in acidic pHs like you'd find in an endosome, their V66 that had better potency also had lower genome ejection. Uh, so it was kind of a more stable at physiological pHs, but less stable at endosomal pHs, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Let's see. So I have a question here um, to, 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 about the big tuna. Um, so it's just asking, uh, so do samples have to be sterile filtered after bump change of big tuna? Uh, in other words, is the system a sterile system or a non-sterile system? Uh, <clears throat> the plates are sterile. So uh, if your application downstream needed the sample to be sterile, yes, we do recommend you sterile filter the sample afterward. Okay, uh, and this is actually probably a question for, for both of you. Uh, is the software for UNCLE and the software for Big Tuna 21 CFR Part 11 compliant? I go first? <laughs> yeah, go, so, ahead. go for it, Donna. So uh, Big Tuna software is not uh, CFR 21 compliant. So. Uh, but UNCLE's is. UNCLE's is can be, uh, has 21 CFR Part 11 compliant tools, and it's pretty easy to set up. Okay. All right, uh, so let's see. There's a lot of questions here, so I'm trying to pick. Um, all right, so the first question, actually was one of the first asked, is so when AAV aggregation is observed, so it's probably a question for Ross, um, how could you characterize these different aggregates to know maybe what they're composed of or just to understand if they're present? Um, so two different ways that we're looking at those two aggregates. The first is with uh, DLS. So uh, in most of our TMT ag experiments, and actually also in viral capsid, we look at DLS4 and at the end of the thermal ramp. So if you're detecting aggregates before the experiment, before the thermal ramp, those aggregates are probably mostly intact capsids, although not necessarily. It's certainly possible that you know, it's already broken down together. Um, SOS is used more to monitor aggregation during the thermal ramp. But as for actually distinguishing what's uh, in those capsids, um, so early in the uh, experiments, uh, you'd probably expect mostly it's intact capsids clumping together, especially if it's before your capsid unfolding temperature. Obviously, if there's not any unfolded capsids, you're not gonna have aggregates made out of unfolded capsids. Uh, and then uh, at the end of a thermal ramp, if you, know, you see large aggregates, then you know, that's gonna be probably mostly just uh, disrupted capsids. Okay, and that sounds like um, there, are a lot, there are a lot more questions in the list here. Uh, so we will definitely follow up uh, with the, the remainder. I, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will you know, say in the interest of time, I think we'll probably uh, wrap it up right there. Uh, so thank you for answering all those uh, questions, Ross and Donna. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. And I want to thank you, all of you who joined live today. Uh, if you'd like to have a, a deeper conversation with our team, uh, please do get in touch with us at info at unshadlabs.com or visit our website at www.unchainlabs.com. Uh, we'll love to connect with you. I know we'll definitely be reaching out to all of the people that asked questions that we didn't get to today. Uh, and thank you again for attending our virtual seminar and I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>